All right, uh, welcome back. Um, today we are following up on the previous conversation we had about educational trauma. Um, in the meantime, I was watching some videos and learning a little bit more about dyslexia and some of the effects. Um, and thinking about the trauma side of things, um, I found out that 35% uh, of students with dyslexia drop out of school. Uh, that's an overrepresentation uh, for students with dyslexia. About 50% of people in drug, drug and alcohol treatment programs have dyslexia. Um, and 70% of juvenile delinquents have dyslexia. So to me, that sounds like uh, indications of behavior following trauma. And um, I'll include in the notes to this uh, video the sources for that. Uh, there's a couple of YouTube videos that I was watching um, that talk about that. I also found out um, people with dyslexia who are empowered and who are um, able to not be traumatized, uh, are, they represent 35% um, of entrepreneurs, 40% of self-made millionaires, and 50% of rocket scientists. Um, dyslexia is known as the MIT disease um, because uh, a lot of people at MIT, apparently, who succeed in, in that school have dyslexia. So uh, it seems, uh, seems that we have uh, a system that might be uh, hurting people that, that can actually do great things for our society right now. And so what I wanted to ask you, Elisa, is um, with those kinds of things in mind, what what do you do? What can we do to heal that educational trauma uh, preventatively um, or, or healing it after it has um, taken place? Great question, Russell. I think there, and there's a couple things I was thinking about when you were going through the statistics. And uh, one of them is a thing in psychology that we call resilience. And so most of us have things in our life that have not gone well. And some of us can bounce back from those pretty quick and others don't bounce back well. And I think the statistics that you're talking about when you talk about these, these kids who um, drop out, suicide rates are incarcerated, juvenile delinquents, I think for a lot of them, they're kids that don't bounce back well. Uh, they don't have the resilience that some of our entrepreneurs have, right? That have dyslexia. So the, and that, then that's a, you know, a question that's plagued psychologists for a long time is how do we build resilience? Can we build resilience? Um, and, and, and really we don't know, the research is still out there, but since we know the brain is plastic and we can change, the brain and and people who are learning and growing are changing their brain every day uh, i want to believe that resilience or growing resilience is possible so i know at the academy we have to work really hard at uh, trying to grow resilience trying to grow um, self-efficacy the belief in self that you know that you are capable of doing something and that's really hard when a child has had um, educational trauma or significant educational trauma. And, and when we say significant, like we had mentioned last time, it doesn't mean um, that they had some horrible event happen, but that, that may be significant in that for five years of their life, they felt in, in, they were in a fight or flight mode at school for eight hours a day, right? So that's a, lot of, that's a lot of stress to be under for a long period of time, which then um, makes its mark on that student in terms of not um, believing in themselves or um, uh, not knowing how to handle a, the just normal stresses of an academic environment. Uh, for them, all of it becomes too much, it becomes really overwhelming. So when we're working on healing the educational trauma here, uh, sometimes we don't, well, most of the time we don't know where it's gonna rear its ugly head. Uh, sometimes we can see it right off the bat just in terms of the, the, 
the way kids view themselves in such a negative light. And so some of the first things we, we will do is really try to work on that self image. Um, talk about, you know, what, what are those voices in your head saying? Are they true? How do you know they're not true? Um, and I think the, the most important thing that we can give them uh, beyond any of the, the, you know, emotional coaching that we can give is that we give them a loving environment, uh, one where they, they really are truly loved and cared for. And uh, I, I was thinking today about the project-based education where I teach. And uh, one of the defining pieces that I was thinking about today as all of my middle school and high schoolers are working on a writing project that's uh, very difficult for them, uh, as it is when you have a language-based learning disability. And, and a criteria for someone who's going to teach project-based learning in an environment like this with kids with educational trauma is that their absolute motivation needs to be every child in my class is going to succeed. That's, that's the minimum. So we don't give grades. So nobody, so I, I can't sit on my, on my backside and just say, well, they're not working, so they're just getting an F. My job is to find out what's stopping them from working, what's, what's the problem, how can we get past it, how can we move forward. And in all of those kinds of things, we're working on the chipping away at that educational trauma. Because usually they're, they're, they're stopped in their tracks because you know, they don't want to fail or they're overwhelmed with whatever's happening. So it, it's not just one thing that we do. It's looking at lots of things, um, you know, from, from the emotional counseling to the everyday, you know, wait a minute, what is your voice telling you right now? And are you going to believe that? Or are you going to believe something else? So constantly challenging that for them too. Wow. Um, you said that they might, the, uh, after educational trauma, someone is maybe not believing in themselves, not knowing how to handle the normal stresses of an academic environment. So um, it, is that something where uh, someone who's maybe not, not experienced that uh, trauma, which might even be low grade over a period of time, um, could be given an assignment and just be like, okay, do the assignment, but someone who's had that trauma is like uh, terrified of any assignment or terrified of any yeah. math or whatever that, whatever that thing might be. Yeah. I don't, I don't think I talked about this last time. I don't, cause I it's can't okay, remember sorry. everything kind of blends together after a while, but um, yeah, I, I wish I had a video going most days, uh, the whole day, right? Because there's, there's, there's gold in everything, you know, in, in, in different parts of our day and we never know where it's going to happen or where it's going to show up. But we were doing um, a math puzzle uh, not very long ago, and one of our students uh, broke down. Uh, I, I, and he, he was very quiet. I, I turned to look, and, and all of a sudden he was crying, you know, tears going down his face. And it wasn't because what we were asking him to do was too hard for him. Uh, he's now been given those skills, and, and he has the academic skills to do what we were asking him to do. But, but being in a situation where he felt like he had to do math was just too overwhelming for him. And that is what I wish parent, parents, not so much parents, but teachers, that's what I wish teachers could see, that, that this is real. What was happening to him was emotionally real for him. And uh, we were able to work through that with him and show him that he had the skills and, and could be successful, but he was emotionally distraught. It was very, very hard to watch someone um, just fill with that much anxiety, um, you know, over, over really adding three numbers. So. Wow. Um, I can see how a student who starts out with, with some uh, language-based learning struggles could then take on those 
uh, those anxieties and then later on uh, no matter what is is you know just always struggling with school because of that um, you, you mentioned uh, the, when you're talking about the criteria of a teacher who is teaching um, these students, uh, the motivation being that every child in my class is going to succeed and not having grades. Um, I think sometimes a person hears no grades, oh, that means there's no standards or there's no um, you know, accountability or something like that. Uh, but when I hear you say that the motivation, that the reason for that is the motivation is that every child is going to succeed. Um, and that path of uh, if, if a student's struggling with something, it's now like the, the job is to help that student through it, not just to, uh, like a grade almost comes across when, when we're thinking about that, a grade is like, oh, you failed, you passed, uh, you know, or you're here on the marker. Um, but if your motivation is to help every child succeed, then like, what's the point of a grade? It's, it's we're gonna do, be together in this until, until we succeed, you know, it doesn't matter you know, I think of maybe running a foot race or something. It doesn't matter if you uh, cross the finish line in four minutes or four hours. Um, it's getting that person across the finish line. Um, can you talk more about that? Like, what what's that like or what's that about? That that was a really good analogy too. And I think that you know, crossing the 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 finish line in four minutes or four hours. That's why I think it takes a unique person to be able to do something like this without having grades, because grades means I get to disseminate information and then it's their responsibility what they do with it, right? They either learn it or they don't learn it. And um, for, for a population of kids with learning issues, that's, that doesn't work for them. We have to help them find success. And so it is. It can be a grueling job. It's super rewarding, though, right? I mean, how many of us have gone over and watched the finish line at the very end of an Ironman, right? To watch those guys pass the finish line is so much more inspiring, really, than watching our elite runners go, right? The, our elite runners, we know they're going to make it, but you know, are those guys that are going to cross the finish line at the very end, are they going to make it before the time limit's up? And, and what they've done and, and, and how they've trained outside of work is totally different than our elite runners, right? So super inspiring to be a part of that. So, so if you're teaching a child in a no grade system, it's much more work because you don't get to sit back and say, well, you know, whatever they get is whatever they get. Your goal is to get every kid to mastery. Uh, and some kids, it may take four days, you know, or whatever. It might take the whole year to get, to get there. But, but on the flip side, the reward for that is super exciting. Uh, you don't, you don't, I, I mean, something that a kid has worked at and worked at and worked at, and now they have success. Uh, well, like this, it gives me goosebumps. So I guess that's why I do this job. <laughs> I love that part of this job. And I think a lot of people have this notion that no grades, uh, yeah, like you said, means no standards. But I think in a no grade system, the standards like this for all the kids. So every kid's going to reach this. How long does it take? How hard do you have to scaffold? How, what do you need to do to change your teaching? I mean, just this week in their writing, um, you know, our kids don't know how to, how to, how to pre-write. So they want to just write the story and be done. So we were going through a lot of pre-writing exercises and they were really struggling with that. And uh, so I, I, you know, kind of gave the parameters of the project and then I, they all seemed like they understood. So they all left to go do that because school's online right now. And uh, I, I went back into their documents to see, you know, what have we done? And they all wrote stories. So they didn't do any of the pre-writing exercise that I had asked. So I said, all right. So the next day I held one-on-one -on -one meetings with all of them. And I had the same conversation with all of them. Hey, what did you understand that I had asked of you? And they didn't understand what I had asked. So I thought I was clear. I wasn't clear apparently. Um, and so I told them, I said, look, when we have communication that, 
you know, it, it looks like there was a miscommunication because we, you know, we're not on the same page. I said, that's both of us, right? So it's how I communicated to you and how you communicated to me. And this is how we got here. It's not just the students. Well, you didn't understand me. So you're, you have the problem. I'm always, I'm constantly analyzing. All right. Well, if I didn't explain that well to this group of kids, how could I do that better next time? Right. And that, what that cost us maybe was a day of writing. So, uh, so it prolonged for, in, for instance, our finish line, but in the end better because I got them eventually to go back and do the pre-writing uh, and the exercises that went along with that to become better writers. So uh, it's, it's, I would say it's harder work when you don't give grades because you constantly are monitoring each student to get them where you need them to be. Um, wow. That, so what I'm hearing in, in the story there is uh, there's something about the traditional model that is, and I, I guess I didn't expect this, um, but it makes sense now, uh, that's saying the student's responsible. Like the teacher's doing their thing and what they do is always the right way to do it. And then the student is just, it's up to the student whether they learn or not. Um, sounds like uh, the traditional model. And then what it sounds like you're maybe talking about is that the teacher is actually responsible it, to a greater degree than, than in the traditional model. Is, is, does that sound accurate or is that missing the point or? No, well, I think, what I do think, you think, I think at least for sure some of that's accurate, right? And I, that's not to diss some of our really phenomenal teachers. I think we got some really great teachers in our public education system who would love to be able to uh, teach in a, in, in, in a similar way that I'm teaching. They, they would love that. They, you know, that they, that they could make sure that those kids that were falling through the cracks don't fall through the cracks because their heart is in it. I believe that for sure. But I, I think that the system itself does not lend itself to that. Uh, and, and even within the system, that's not to say that teachers don't care. You know, there is, I think, but I do think there is a certain amount of uh, my job, your job. And uh, at least for these kids with learning issues, uh, I have to let a lot of that go. Some days I don't want to, right? Some days I'm like, okay, like I told you guys four times. <laughs> really? You know, I mean, I'm a human being. I'm normal, like, <laughs> like everybody. But then I have to go home and I have to self-analyze and I have to go, well, look, Elisa, you gave them five instructions and this kid over here has an auditory processing problem and he, his auditory working memory is only big enough to hold one piece of information. So why did you give him five pieces of auditory information and expect him to be able to handle it? That's on me, right? And I, because I'm a normal person, I don't always remember to give just one piece of information. I, I give five pieces and, and, and I want him to, you know, like that student in particular to be able to come to me and say, I got the one, but I didn't get any of the others. Uh, but that's not, that's, you know, that's part of the learning experience uh, for him. So like I said, I don't think that our traditional teachers are necessarily, you know, it's, it's, it's this, you know, them versus us kind of thing. I think there's a lot of fantastic traditional, you know, teachers teaching our traditional environment, but they have their hands tied. They can't do all that they want, but there are some great teachers who stay after school, who, who go out of their way to, to help kids learn. But I think it still goes back to, I will go out of my way to help you learn, but you need to show up after school where uh, we, we don't have that. So we go out of our way to make sure you learn in the, while you're here with us. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And I think the, uh, when, I've, when I've spoken with good friends that are uh, teachers, uh, they'll acknowledge much the same thing, especially the ones that really do care. Um, I, I would think most of my friends that are teachers really do care uh, from, from what I know of them. Um, but like you said, it's, it has to be after school and now it's a um, maybe a punishment to that kid who's you know not getting to do the sports that they wanted to do or not getting to play with the other kids after school whatever that might be 
um, because now they have to go after school um, to get farther or to get the information or whatever they need to do. Well, um, and I think when we have that kind of mentality that you've got your responsibility, I have my responsibility, you're, you're making assumptions about that child that they are capable of, ma of, of doing their part. And I think that maybe is the difference. Here, I, if a student's not succeeding, I have to ask myself, are they capable of doing what I just asked them to do? Right? And if not, how do I scaffold this in such a way that they can have success on their own, have success? Because it's not like these kids are, are uh, lazy. They just might not be capable of what I asked them to do or how I asked them to do it. We, need to, we might need to change it. Uh, that seems like the the clincher right there, being able to ask that question. So that's that's pretty pretty cool. Um, I'm I wonder if anybody watching this would uh, at, who might be a teacher might be thinking, oh man, I want to go work for Elisa and work <laughs> in that school and uh, be able to, like you said, do uh, do the right thing by these kids. So that's pretty cool. But is it, it is a tiring job sometimes, but it's really rewarding. It, it's, it's more rewarding than it is tiring. Well, that's good. That's good. Everything that's wor worth doing is, is, you know, there's effort behind it, so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, wow, I, I just, I love the orientation that you're giving towards, towards how, to, how to think about students and how to think about teaching, um, both, both of those things. Really, that, question, even as just a, a parent, uh, if you're asking your child to do something that they're not capable of doing, um, you know, that that's something maybe we could all be asking ourselves <laughs> anytime we're asking. Or if you're, heck, if you're an employer and you have employees and you're asking them to do something, you might, might ask yourself, are they capable of doing that thing? So. Well, and I think that, <laughs> don't you think that's, I mean, it's one of the difficult things about a learning disability, right? Like, like, uh, the learning disability is invisible, right? We can't see it. Uh, the educational trauma that we've been talking about, it's invisible. We can't see it until the behavior rears its ugly head. Um, but it's funny because we don't, we don't question that when it comes to Alzheimer's or dementia, right? We say, oh, they're not capable of that anymore. So we can't ask them to do that anymore, right? They're not capable of doing their taxes anymore. And we we seem to be okay with that at that end of the spectrum, even though, you know, dementia is invisible as well. We can't see it physically, but we can see it in their behaviors, but we see it in the behaviors of kids too. We just look at a child who's apparently refusing to do something and we, we immediately think, um, well, they're being obstinate or they're being lazy or something like that. So it sounds like you're describing like there's a core thing that we're misclassifying behaviors of students. Right, I think we're, so. Okay. Right, it goes back to your question. Are, are we asking, are they capable of what we're asking, right? Mm -hmm. My dad has Lewy body dementia. Is he capable of doing what I'm asking? You know, it, it, and I, my answer, you know, for most of the things I would think for my dad are, are no now, right? No, he's not capable of that anymore. But I don't, then think, oh, well, he's just being lazy or he's just not trying to strengthen his mind or, you know, if he would just read a few more books, which my dad with Louis Body reads, reads hundreds of books a year. So, so that's certainly not the problem for him, but he's still not capable, right? But my empathy for my dad, it, it, and I think for j most people in general, when they realize, oh, somebody has dementia, then they, oh, I get it right? But when we say he has dyslexia, they don't go, oh, I get it. It, it seems like, because I'm still thinking about this grading system, it seems like the grades uh, mean how hard did you try, not how hard, like, like the meaning of the meaning of the grades is, like, if you get a C, it's like, well, you did average work. Or if you get an F, you did failure level work, like you just didn't try hard enough. It, Whereas if it was being used to say, oh, this student isn't, maybe isn't capable of what we asked them and needs help, that might be a different orientation. Yeah, different. I, don't, 
I mean, we'd have to talk to some traditional uh, teachers. I, I am not a teacher from the traditional system. So, uh, and my field is in psychology. So I'm looking at things from a different perspective that a, than a teacher who was trained to teach. Right. So, um, so that's, so it's a different perspective. I, and I think that is kind of what we've always said. This is, you know, this is average work. This is above average work. So you put in extra time, right? But I, oh, sorry, I saw a, a student, we were making posters and, you know, this kid has dysgraphia. So he, his poster doesn't, it doesn't look all shiny and bright like, you know, one of our artist students, right? It's pretty rough around the edges. The writing's pretty ragged, if you will. Uh, but I know that he put a tremendous amount of effort into that. So, you know, I don't know how you would, I mean, I know how I would grade it, but I don't know in a traditional system, I don't think he would get very many points because the rubric would be set up to be, you know, did you put a lot of, you know, was it apparent that you put a lot of time into it, right? Do you have a lot of bells and whistles? Does it look pretty? Well, I mean, when I look at his poster, I don't go, oh, that looks pretty. Uh, but I know how much effort he put into it. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. That's, that's interesting, man. And um, boy, when it comes to it, when it comes to the, how the trauma happens, it seems like there's, I mean, that, that misclassifying uh, potentially of behavior as, um, you know, stubbornness or, or obstinance or something like that instead of not being capable might lead to uh, the kinds of responses from uh, from the teachers or, or whomever uh, that creates that trauma right. thing and then it like this just filters on down um, it, it seems it seems like there's ways in which a student's set up to fail uh, unless unless you intentionally set them up for success which it sounds like is what you're doing so Wow, that's that's incredible. It, it, I guess it, it it's painting a whole like full picture, full circle picture for me um, about how that how about that how that happens to a student or for a student, and how you can help them. So I think that's pretty cool um, that you can help them and you can, you know, I mean it's it sounds like kind of like rescuing uh, rescuing a student who's who's experienced that and. Um, giving them a completely different educational experience where they can learn and can be happy to learn and enjoy learning. That's the idea, right? And that, and I think that's, that's where then you get back to, you know, how do we heal? How do we heal our kids um, that have struggled with educational trauma that have been hurt? Um, and I think that's how you do it, right? Uh, even if you're, even if you bring them to a home environment, you know, they can't come to the academy. I don't think the academy's, you know, the answer to everything. I think if you look at your kiddo and you're like, this is not good for him or her emotionally, and I'm losing my child. Um, the one, you know, the happy, vivacious little kid that I had is now turning sullen and distancing uh, him or herself. It, you know, if you, if you decide to take them home and give them that loving, unconditional, uh, loving environment, uh, you're, you're healing, you're healing them too. And, you know, you're speaking those words into their life that you've got this, you can do it. You, ha you, you are capable. Uh, so that kind of environment can be a great environment too. So there, and I'm not just homeschooling. I mean, there could be other educational places as well that are offering that kind of environment that will help heal a child from educational trauma. Yeah, that's incredible. I um, I think we talk about in another video what what a parent could do when they when they encounter this sort of stuff. So um, maybe check that out for some resources there too. So uh, wow, thank you. I think this was really fantastic. Uh, really appreciate it. So thank you very much. You're welcome, Russell. Thanks.